Welcome to the OCC Podcast. Whether you're listening to this at home, on the road, at work, or in the gym, we're so glad you decided to join us as we study God's Word together. We hope and pray that through this ministry, you will grow in your relationship with God as well as become a chair for disciple maker. But for now, sit back and let us help you see how the Bible applies to your life today. Are we plugged into the source? Good question. Of course, last night we were plugged in and it still didn't matter. No power anywhere. But, <laughs> but here's the great thing with God. You never have to worry about that. You're always plugged into that power source. This is what we've been talking about. Welcome. We're so, so glad to have you guys here. Welcome to those of you in the room. Welcome to those joining us online. We were actually looking at some of our statistics this week and some of that stuff's hard to track. But like we've got folks literally watching kind of all over the country, which is really, really neat. There's lots of folks back in Missouri where I'm from, but there were folks in Texas, there are folks in Nebraska, and that part's kind of exciting. Now, that doesn't make us famous or anything, right? We're not like TV stars, but I heard a story about a guy, and he actually, it seemed like he was kind of famous. Like everywhere he went, it doesn't matter if he was in his hometown or if he was visiting somewhere, he, he would always run into somebody he knew. Some, everywhere he went. And so it got to be where it's kind of weird, and one of his buddies was with him, and, and he asked this guy, his name was Dave, he's like, Dave, who's the most famous person that you know? It seems like everywhere you go, you know somebody. And Dave was like, well, I, I don't pay attention to who's famous and who's not famous. I just meet people, you know? And the guy's like, well, like, do you know Ken Griffey Jr., Seattle Mariner legend, the kid? Do you know him? He's like, oh, yeah, I know the kid. He's like, no, you don't. He's like, yeah, I do. I know him. And so this guy decided he was going to put Dave to the test. He goes, well, I happen to know that Griffey lives down in Orlando, Florida. Let's drive down there and you can introduce me to him. And I said, well, that's great. So they get in the car and they literally drive down to Orlando, Florida, this gated community where Griffey lives. And they pull up and there's, you know, a security gate and an announcer and you got to hit the intercom. And, and, and so Dave hits the intercom. And he's like, hey, I'm here to see Ken Griffey Jr., and the guy at the security shack is like, I bet you are. And he's like, no, I'm a friend of his. Just buzz him and you'll find out. And he goes along with it and he buzzes Ken Griffey Jr.'s house. And sure enough, Jr.'s on the intercom. And Dave goes, hey, hey, it's me. And Ken Griffey Jr. goes, Dave, is that you? Oh, man, I was just telling somebody about you. Man, come on in. Oh, I want to talk, catch up. Let's talk. You know? And so they can't believe it. But Dave drives in with his buddy, right? And they drive up in front of Ken Griffey Jr.'s house, his mansion there. And, and, and I don't know if you knew this or not, and I'm surprised to learn it. Two houses down from Ken Griffey Jr. in this gated community on a lake, on a golf course, is where Tiger Woods lives. And Tiger Woods was there, and he's chipping balls in his backyard. And Dave gets out of the car, and Tiger sees him, and he goes, Dave, <laughs> how you doing? It's like, I haven't seen you in forever. Come on. And so, so instead of going into Ken Griffey Jr.'s house, Dave walks over, and he's going to go say hi to Tiger Woods. Well, he has to walk through the neighbor's backyard. There's a guy who lives between Griffey and, and Tiger Woods. And, and there's all this commotion and everything. And so that guy comes out on his back porch, and he looks... And it's none other than legendary film actor Tom Cruise lives between Griffey and Tiger Woods. And he sees a guy walking through and he goes, Dave, is that you? <laughs> and so Tom Cruise comes down now and he's talking to Dave and Tiger Woods comes over because now Dave isn't coming. You know. And so all this is interrupted by the sound of ambulance sirens. And the ambulance comes racing up and it turns out Dave's buddy had a cardiac arrest, Right. And they got to take him to the hospital. And, and he recovers and he gets released to a room and Dave goes up to visit him. He's like, man, what happened? The guy's like, well, I was doing pretty good standing there next to Ken Griffey Jr. until he leaned over and said, hey, who's that guy talking with Dave and Tiger Woods? <laughs> Some people are famous <laughs> and some people are not. We're going to study the Bible today and we're going to run into a guy who is famous. Everybody knows this guy, right? That's, that's the thing about it. Acts chapter 9 is where we are. We're continuing in our unplugged series, and we're looking at how we join God, right? How we get plugged in. And it happens the moment we profess faith. Our lives are transformed. And so we're going to talk about a guy today who has left a legacy in Christianity for sure. And, and we talk about folks this way. We talk about people who are important to history, right? Right? We just finished celebrating our nation's independence, and I guarantee you heard a lot this week about the guys who were founding fathers. You can't talk about Fourth of July without talking about George Washington and Thomas Jefferson and John Adams, right? 
There's certain things you, you can't talk about without mentioning people who are important. You don't talk about the emancipation of slaves. You don't talk about the eradication of race-based slavery without talking about who? Abraham Lincoln. You don't talk about the civil rights movement in America without talking about who? Martin Luther King Jr. We get that, right? Those guys kind of rise above. Well, if you ever think about it, biblical history is kind of the same way. We don't ever talk about the nation of Israel without talking about who? Father Abraham. He's important to that. We don't talk about God's people, the Israelites, unless we talk about Moses. He's important to that. But if I were to ask everybody here, and I had to impress you on it, and I said, who's the most famous person in the Bible? And you can't say Jesus, right? Because <laughs> that's cheating. It can't be anybody who's in the Trinity, right? But if I said, who's the most famous person in the Bible? I think every person in this room would say, it's the Apostle Paul, right? He's the guy. Well, that's who we're going to study today. And it's really incredible when we talk about it because as we see in his story, when we encounter him, he seems like the most unlikely person ever to become the face of Christianity. When we first ran into him just a couple weeks ago, when we were talking about it, we saw that he was actively trying to destroy God's unstoppable church. The text said he was ravaging Christ followers. He was literally trying to kill them. Is that the guy who's going to be the face of Christianity? What becomes real obvious is that God doesn't work the way we work, right? He might choose someone that we wouldn't choose. At the very beginning of Acts chapter 2, do you remember? He, he was going to pick a guy who was going to preach a sermon that was literally going to launch the church. Would we have picked a guy, if we were in that spot, who had literally just denied knowing Jesus about three months earlier? No, but Jesus does. He picks Peter. Last week, we looked at the story of the Ethiopian eunuch, and he heard about Jesus. And who got to share that story with him? It was Philip. Would we have picked Philip? Philip was a guy busier than a long-tailed cat in a room full of rocking chairs hundreds of miles away. Would we have said, hey, let's pluck that guy and make him the guy? No, but God works in different ways than we would. And so when we talk about the person who's going to be the face of Christianity who's going to carry the gospel message to people who are not like him, do we think we'd pick God's own worst enemy? That's who God picks. Of course, he's going to have to undergo this incredible conversion, this transformation. God's going to literally change Saul from the inside out and then launch him into ministry. And that's what we're going to study over the next couple weeks, kind of a long passage. We'll look at the first half today. This is in chapter 9 of Acts. We're going to look at verses 1 to 19. And we're going to do this a little different. If you're with us, if this is where you come to study, we normally kind of break stuff down and go kind of verse by verse. We're going to read all 19 of these verses so we can catch everything in context. Then we'll come back and dig into a little bit of the details. If you don't have your Bible with you, we'll have it on the screen. Acts 9, starting verse 1. But Saul... Still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, he went to the high priest there in Jerusalem, and he asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus. The synagogue in Jerusalem would have had authority over all the other synagogues. He wanted these letters so that if he found any belonging to the way. Now, that's the term the early church used instead of Christianity. We talk about Christianity. They talk about the way. That's what they called the followers because they were part of the way, the truth, the life. So that's what they're referencing here. Saul's wanting to go round up Christ followers. It says men are women. Why? So he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. So he's on his way. He approaches Damascus and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. Boom. Falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul. Why are you persecuting me? And Saul asked a question that indicates he knows. <laughs> he said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I'm Jesus whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city and you will be told what you are to do. Let me take a quick time out. With all the craziness that's going on in this world that we live in, with all the issues that we've got going on, are we even asking the right questions? to know how to address them? Saul asked two questions here. One's recorded in the text. The other, I believe, is implied in Dr. Luke's account. But Saul asks, who are you, Lord? And what do you want me to do? <laughs> two great questions for us to ask always. But Saul understands Jesus is Lord. And the implied question, Jesus tells Saul, hey, go into the city, just wait for more instruction. Okay? Verse 7. 
The men who were traveling with Saul stood speechless, hearing the voice but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight. He neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple at Damascus. His name was Ananias. And the Lord said to Ananias in a vision, and he called him, and Ananias said, Here I am, Lord. And by the way, that's the answer we're supposed to have when we ask Jesus that second question. God, what do you want me to do, right? We're supposed to say, here I am. I'm your huckleberry. Let's go, whatever you got. Verse 11. And the Lord said to him, rise and go to the street called Straight. And at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying. And he's seen in his vision a man named Ananias come in, lay his hands on him so that Saul might regain his sight. Now, Ananias had just said, I'm your guy, right? Here, verse 13, but Ananias said, Lord, I've heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here's where Ananias starts to sound a little more like us, right? Because we can be all gung-ho, I'm your man, I'm your guy. And then God asks us to do something, we're like, ooh, except for that. (laughs) That sounds kind of hard. Do you have anything less dangerous, Lord? Verse 14. And here he has authority from the chief priest, Saul does, that's what the letters he got were, to bind all who call on your name. Ananias is scared. But the Lord said to Ananias, go, for Saul is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel too. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed. He entered the house, laying his hands on Saul. He said, brother Saul. The Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you came, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he regained his sight. He rose, he was baptized, and taking food, he was strengthened. Now, this is a really important passage and text, right? I would say, honestly, next to Christ raising from the dead, this might be the most famous story in all of Scripture, right? This account of Paul's conversion. And it teaches us something so theologically important, I don't want us to miss it, okay? It's the first point on your outline if you grabbed one coming in. Jesus pursues us before we pursue him. Did we catch that? There at the beginning of chapter 9, was Saul actively seeking Jesus? No. No. He was actively seeking to destroy, to to keep people from following Jesus, right? He was ravaging and murdering followers of the way, but God was pursuing Saul. And as we see Saul become Paul, as we see his life play out through the study of Acts, if we see then in reading the the rest of the Bible, you find 13 letters that God breathed into Saul. He's using this guy, right? And that lets us see God's able to save anyone. God can use any one of us. He can transform the greatest of sinners like he did for Saul, like he did for me. God can convert anyone and then use them to spread the gospel. But, and we're going to see this play out as we move forward, because of Saul's past life, because of that baggage that he had where he was persecuting the church, where people were scared to death of him, When he goes to share the gospel, it's going to make it pretty tricky. He's going to go share the good news with people, and they're going to go, "Uh -uh uh-uh-uh, I ain't falling for it. You're just going to try and kill me, right? That's what he's going to run into. But there's great application points in a story like Saul's, because we need to recognize what really happened here. Humanly speaking, Saul was not a great candidate for salvation, right? Right? The people back in the day, hearing that Saul had become a Christ follower, that would be like the Jews during the time of Hitler, hearing Hitler had accepted Christ and was now going to go out and convert the Jews, right? This is just a weird, weird message. It's ludicrous on the surface. There's no human explanation for Saul's conversion. But let's be real honest. There's no human explanation for any of our conversion. God gets the glory all the time. Salvation is from him. It's God's grace, not man's efforts, right? And we know his ways are higher 
than our ways. He's able to do things we couldn't possibly imagine. And he's able to use people we would never think of. And so Luke begins the passage that way. You remember that he starts out saying Saul's just breathing murderous threats all the time. He wants to wipe out followers of the way. That's his mission. He's so devoted to that cause that when we find him, he's 125 miles away from where he started. He's heading to Damascus because he's chasing people down who are following Jesus. And he wants to literally bind them up and drag them back into Jerusalem to harm them. He is a cruel guy. The text says he's hunting down men and women. Doesn't matter. He, he's that cruel. And he does it because the text tells us he's zealous for the law of Moses. But he doesn't understand the law of Moses. He doesn't get the true purpose. He thought these people who were starting the early church were heretics. He thought they were misinterpreting God's plan. And so he was determined to stop what they were doing. And I can just imagine, he's got a group of folks with him we see in the text, and they're walking along on the road to Damascus, and I think the conversation they're having is, man, I can't wait to stop these murderous, horrible people. Can you believe that they think Jesus rose from the dead? And they're laughing and joking about the things they're going to do, and then bam, he's on his backside. God just levels him. Can we picture that? Can we put ourselves in that story? There's this bright light from heaven all around the traveling party, and Saul's literally off his feet. Every time I try to put myself in that spot, I, I, just, I get goosebumps. I, I imagine myself there 28 years ago when God called my name. Can, can I imagine that? God just knocking me on my backside, James, James, why are you persecuting me? That's what happens to Saul. And the text tells us, Saul knows what's up. He says, who are you, Lord? Dead giveaway, he knows something's going on. But I don't think he was fully prepared for the answer he received. Because God says, well, it's me, it's Jesus. I'm the second person in the Godhead. I'm the one you're persecuting. And I believe Saul had a follow-up question while he's leveled there on the ground. What do you want me to do? And we see only Jesus' answer. He says, get up, go into the city. It's just like he told Philip last week on the road to Gaza. You just get up and be obedient, and I'll tell you more later on. <laughs> you got to be obedient now, and we'll get the details later. Of course, there's a little problem with Saul becoming a, a riser in winter, as Brenton mentioned last week. Why? He's now blind. <laughs> it was great when he could see his way on the road to Damascus. Now he's literally got to have somebody lead him, right? This is a pretty neat picture for us because Saul had been spiritually blind for quite some time. He couldn't see what God was up to. Now he's literally blind to go along with it. We see how this story kind of unfolds. Three days later, God uses this guy by the name of Ananias. This is Ananias' only appearance in the Bible, and it's a big one, right? And he's obedient. He gets this really difficult task. Hey, you're going to go and lay hands on this guy who's going to become the greatest missionary, the greatest church planner, the greatest theologian in history. But it's the guy who is devoted with every single breath to murdering Christ followers to stopping God's unstoppable church. And now he's going to become the guy who's devoted to making disciples who make disciples. Lots of neat ways we could go with this story, and we're going to dig into more of these next week. But I want to pause and just consider the second point on the outline. And it's this. Every aspect of Paul's changed life story, God gets the glory. Saul didn't earn any of this, right? We're going to see how this plays out. Saul was not pursuing God. God was pursuing Saul. Now, Saul would have said, if you asked him, that he was a God guy, right? We read about this later on to the church in Philippi. When he was Paul, he was bragging about his time as Saul. And he said this, I was circumcised on the eighth day. I was of the people of Israel. I was the tribe of Benjamin. I was a Hebrew of Hebrews. As to the law, I was a Pharisee. See, Saul really thought he was something. But what we don't see is God coming to Saul and going, well, gosh, since you're such a great guy, pretty please would you put your faith in me? Oh, please, 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 Saul. That's not the way it works. What does God do? Boom! He just levels him. He just knocks him down, right? There, there's a prayer that I pray for people, and it's a dangerous prayer. 
It's a scary prayer. I've prayed it for some of you. I know that for years, people prayed it for me. For years they did. But, but there's a need to pray this prayer. There's a reality for people as we grow. I don't know if you're aware of this or not. Statistics are sobering on this. As we get a little older, especially as we become adults, as we get jobs, as we start making money, as we start making a bunch of decisions, what happens? We think we're in charge. There's statistics that say if people don't accept Christ by the time they turn 22, most folks never will. Why? Because we really think we're something. We think we're in control. We think we're in charge. And what happens then? We are severely discounting the fact that God is sovereign over all things. (laughs) He's the person in charge of everything. Young people accept Christ. Kids, high school students, even college students in a lot of ways. We're starting VBS tomorrow with all the decorations. We love VBS. Can't tell you the number of testimonies I've heard where somebody says, well, I remember one time I went to VBS and I heard the gospel. Young kids will accept the gospel. Why? Because they don't have as much baggage. They don't have a bunch of stuff they put in the way. Adults do that. And so I pray this dangerous prayer. You know what the prayer is? God, just break that person. Whatever it would take for them to recognize their need for you, I want that. That's scary. But this is the pattern that we see in Scripture. It's what happens here. Saul gets knocked down. He gets blinded. Famously in the Psalms, King David, if you remember the context of this, King David talks to God, and it's right in that situation where Nathan comes to him and says, hey, you were an idiot with Bathsheba. And do you remember what David says to God? Psalm 51, starting at verse 16. David says, For you will not delight in sacrifice, God, or I'd give it. You'll not be pleased with a burnt offering. Remember the Old Testament sacrificial system. David says, That's not going to work. Verse 17. The sacrifices of God are what? Broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. You ever wonder why prison ministry is so successful? There's a reason, because those folks in prison are broken. They've come to the ends of themselves. There's clarity in realizing there's nothing they can do to save themselves. God gives them that gift. Hey, you can't earn your own salvation. You have to profess faith in me. And God gets the glory when broken things are redeemed. Church, our salvation does not depend on our own effort. Praise the Lord. God gets the glory. It's his grace. See, God didn't choose Saul because he thought he saw something valuable in his nature, right? Saul hadn't done anything at this point in time to make him worthy of God's grace. God didn't look down on Saul and go, I think sometime in the future, he's going to make some pretty good decisions. And that guy, he'll probably be a pretty good apostle. And so I'll make him one of my elect. No, that's not the way that works. That would make God's election dependent on something good in man, like our wise choices or our potential. Read the book of Romans. That's not the way salvation works, okay? We don't choose God on our own. He chooses us. He saves us. And when he does, he gets the glory. And his glory is always supposed to be our primary focus. But here's the deal. No one, I mean no one, is out of God's reach. Amen? If God can save Saul and transform him into the most famous Christ follower ever, is there anyone God can't save? He's supposed to do next. It truly highlights God's sovereignty over all things. And you notice, he doesn't give Saul a choice, right? Hey, Saul, you're going to be the one to go out and share my gospel message. Do you want to do that in this area where you know a lot of people? Do you want to do this in this area where you've got the same educational background? Or would you like to take a look at what's behind curtain number two? How would you like to go to this heathen group of people that you don't know whatsoever? Ooh, tough choice. I'll take the non-heathens. No, it doesn't work that way, right? Saul doesn't get that choice because God is in control. And he can use anyone he wants any way he wants. It's a trifling analogy, but I was journaling and thinking about that this week. What if God would have asked 25-year-old James Green one year before he rescued me. <laughs> hey, James, what do you think? 
you want to continue to live in this town where you own this sporting goods store where you went to grade school and high school and college and, and where you know everybody and where you're super comfortable? You want to stay here for the rest of your life or <laughs> and take what's behind curtain number two. Join me on this plan I have, this unstoppable plan. If you join me on this, though, eventually you're going to have to move 2,100 miles away from home in this place where you don't know anybody. Here's the beauty of something like that. If I would have got to make that decision based on the things that I knew and was comfortable with, I would have blown that up. If I got to make that decision based on my selfish desires, eh, praise the Lord, God is wiser. (laughs) He knows what's best, amen? Do we trust God? Do we trust that he's in control of all things? Now, yes, he allows us to join him, and then we get to make decisions. This is why we pray for discernment. We want to make godly ones. But God's will is going to be done, 100%. Certainly when it comes to salvation, when it comes to transformation, because he's the one doing the saving, and he gets the glory. Third neat takeaway, I think, in this passage, when God does transform someone, usually there's signs. Usually we see some evidence, right? And we talked about this a couple weeks ago, and this is frustrating. Sometimes we don't see signs, right? There are people, honestly, they don't pass the fruit test. We never see any fruit from them, and God and I talk about that. But but usually, when God changes someone from the inside out, there's going to be signs, right? There'll be evidence. Well, look at Saul's life, and you see all kinds of evidence. And it starts with a really big one. He seems convicted of his sin. Where does conviction of sin come from? The Holy Spirit inside of us. And I think we see that in Saul. And God does that cool thing where he really smacks him to get his attention. Did you catch what he did? He calls him by name twice. Saul, Saul. How many times do we see that in Scripture? Simon, Simon. Martha, Martha. Jerusalem, oh, Jerusalem. What's God doing? He's trying to get our attention with that repetition. And so he snaps Paul awake here because Saul thought he was being zealous for the Lord with his persecution efforts. Turns out he's actually persecuting Jesus. Saul, Saul is going to smack him right in the face. I mean, gauge the impact of the Lord's voice, his words, because in response, what happens? Saul doesn't eat anything, drink anything for three days. Now, that wasn't Saul going, well, this is really wild. I'm going to fast and pray about this. No, (laughs) this is that thing that happens to us when a tragedy comes. Someone dies unexpectedly. We're mourning, and what happens? We don't even think about eating. We'll go a long time without eating or drinking because we're wrestling with that, right? That's what Saul's doing. He's coming face to face with this fact that he was doing it all wrong. He was ravaging the church thinking he was doing right in God's eyes. And he finds out he had it 100% wrong. And being blind, not being able to see anything literally, allowed him to be able to see spiritually, oh my gosh, I'm a sinner. I'm doing this wrong. And that's necessary for us to understand our need for salvation. One of my favorite theologians who's not named Paul is a guy named Charles Haddon Spurgeon. Spurgeon has a quote that I I read right after I became a Christ follower. It still hurts to read to this day, but I'm going to share it with you. He wrote, today, and he was speaking of his day, but man, does this ring true in our day. Today, we have so many built up who were never pulled down. So many filled who were never emptied. So many exalted who were never humbled. That I the more earnestly remind you that the Holy Ghost must convince of sin or we cannot be saved. What's Spurgeon saying? You got to pray that prayer for brokenness. We have to pray for people to come to the end of themselves and recognize their need for genuine transformation. And when we see that, I think that's pretty clear evidence that God is at work, right? And this is what we see, honestly, in Paul's life. He's he's heading to Damascus. Why? To arrest all the Christ followers. But God strikes him down. He strikes him blind. And instead of walking into Damascus strong and independent, the guys literally have to lead him into Damascus. Weak, independent. Isn't that how we have to come to the Lord? 
We can't overpower our own transformation. We don't go into the gym and deadlift our way to salvation. That's not the way it works. We got to come in humble. And then we receive salvation as a gift. That's actually what we see from Paul. He's now humble, or Saul, he's now humble. He's now contrite. I think that's part of the reason God uses Ananias in this account. Saul was a guy who thought a ton of himself, but he had some bona fides, right? He'd been trained by the leading rabbi of the day, a guy named Gamaliel. He was from Tarsus. I don't know if you know this part or not. Tarsus was like known for its education center. Like if you wanted to be educated, Tarsus was where you went. Saul likely went to that education center. And so he was a smart, smart guy. And now he's sitting there blind, having to take help from this simple servant, Ananias. He's convicted of his sin. He's humbled. He's also obedient. Did you catch that? He hadn't eaten for three days, right? Hadn't drunk anything. And now all of a sudden, he he figures out what's going on. He gets his sight back. And he goes, man, I'm hungry. Let's go get some pizza. Is that what he said? No, he said, let's go get baptized. I want to be obedient to identifying with Christ through baptism. We'll stop at Vasari's on the way back. But he was going to do the obedient thing, right? He's convicted of his sin. He's humble. He's obedient. There's another great indicator that he's a transformed man in verse 11. And this is something, I don't know if we think about this all that often. Did you catch what Saul was doing when Ananias arrived? He's praying. Now, again, I know there are some folks who don't know the Lord who will occasionally cry out in prayer. I remember hearing a story one time, and I doubt it's true, about an atheist guy. And and this atheist, he'd spent his life disavowing God, right? And he was out hiking in the backwoods in, in Idaho. He's hiking in bear country, and sure enough, he runs into a bear. And he does that thing you're supposed to do where you make yourself big and make the noise and bear's like, you know. And so the bear starts chasing after him and this guy starts running. He's running for his life and he runs up to the edge of a cliff and it's like 200 feet straight down and there he is. Turn around and face the bear or fall to your death. And this atheist guy cried out, God, please help me. And time stopped. Literally, the bear's like in mid-lunge, you know, and just stops right there. And this atheist hears a voice from above, and it goes, seriously? (laughs) Spent your whole life denying that I exist, and now you're going to call out for help? Atheist goes, yeah, I I can see where that would seem a bit hypocritical. (laughs) I I understand that you're under no obligation to save me here. I get that. But but listen, since you're real, since you exist, if you're not going to save me, Could you do me a favor? Could you make this bear a Christ follower? Could you make him one of yours? Maybe he'll offer me some mercy. And God goes, you got it. Boom, all of a sudden time comes back. This bear's a roar. And he goes, Father, thank you for this meal that I'm about to receive. (laughs) Sometimes folks who don't know the Lord will pray, but typically... It's people we see who know the Lord who are praying. It's it's one of the evidences of our relationship with God, right? Comes from being transformed. And Saul's here praying. And this is likely the first time he's ever really prayed, right? Genuinely prayed. I'm sure he had said liturgical type prayers before. But now he's really asking for God's will to be done. More evidence of transformation. There's another great piece of evidence here, I think, and it's fellowship. And we talk about this all the time because this is our purpose here as a church to help people be relationally connected. But there's something so neat in verse 17. When Ananias arrives to meet with Saul, did you hear what he called him? Brother Saul, right? Now that would have infuriated Saul before because he didn't want anything to do with the way. But now, gosh, what a great name. He's going to get a changed name when God makes him Paul. But here he gets Brother Saul. That's a sign of fellowship. There's one more piece of evidence I see that points to Saul being new from the inside out. And it's really where we got this whole idea of being plugged in, right? Once he receives that indwelling Holy Spirit, he gets a new purpose in life. His purpose totally changes. What was his purpose before? He was going to kill Christ followers. He was going to ravage the church. He was going to persecute those followers of the way. Well, what's his purpose now? Verse 15 tells us he's going to go be God's ambassadors to the Gentiles. Some Jews too, if he can use equal opportunity, whoever he comes in contact with. But his primary audience is going to be these non-Jewish people. 
There's people who didn't grow up with the same background that he did. That leads us to the last point on the outline. God can and will use anyone he desires to share the gospel. Saul was transformed, right? He was on mission before, but it was an evil mission. It was a self-willed mission. And now, although he thought he was serving God before by eliminating the church, he, he was just feeding his own pride. He was just fueling his own lusts. Paul was a guy that when we correlate scripture, it seems like he had a pride problem. He shared that with the church that met in Galatia. As he's talking about his former way of life as Saul, he said, I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people. Why? So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. Saul was on the fast track. He was up and coming, right? Do you remember when we first encountered Saul, where that was? The stoning of Stephen? And everybody came in. Do you remember what they did? They dropped their coats there at where? Saul's feet. Why did they do that? Because Saul was in charge. He was the leader, right? Saul used to be there supervising the suffering of others. What's going to happen now? His purpose has changed. And verse 16 says, now Saul's going to suffer in Christ's name. Saul's going to have to die to himself in order to live for Christ. That's his new purpose in life. That's the mission Paul's literally going to give his life for. And we know when studying the Bible, he goes on all these missionary journeys. And if you've ever looked at the map of all that and seen where he's gone around, even just in those three or potentially four journeys we know about, the amount of travel, I read a commentary this week that said on average, if you look at Saul's life as soon as he became Paul, he spent the rest of his life trekking like 20 miles a day. And this is not walking like we do on the levee where it's real nice and paved and there's a river and it's all pretty. No, th this is through rugged terrain. He's walking 20 miles a day. He's willing to get out of his comfort zone. Why? Because he's got a new purpose. He's going to go share the gospel. Are we willing to get out of our comfort zone? I don't know if we're getting out of our house. As we're walking on the levee, are we sharing Christ with people? Come back next week. We're, we're going to get to hear part two of Saul's incredible transformation. But as we leave today, I want to challenge us with one big application from Saul's transformation. Toward the end of his life on earth, Paul said this. This is 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 16. But I received mercy. Where did he receive mercy? When he was laying flat down, blinded, right? I received mercy for this reason. Why, Paul? That in me, as the foremost... Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. Saul's transformation is an example for us. It's an example of the fact that not a single one of us is too far gone for God's mighty power to save us. It's an example that once God gets a hold of a life, you might move 2,100 miles away from your hometown to go preach Jesus. It's an example of what God can do. It's an example of how we're supposed to share Christ with everybody we encounter, no matter how wicked we think they are. That's the example. Saul's changed life. Saul's changed purpose. And so that's the question I want to challenge us with as we leave today. Do we want real transformation in our lives? Or are we okay just settling the appearance of a changed life? I'm going to close with this example, and I want you to hear me real clearly that I'm not bagging on people who own a camper, okay? That's not my desire. If you go camping in a camper as opposed to a tent, I think you're pretty smart. In a lot of regards, it rains. I get that. But <laughs> don't put words in my mouth. I'm not anti-camper. I, I just remember the Jim Gaffigan joke. He was out camping in a tent, and somebody pulled up next to him in an RV site, and he went, oh, that's what I forgot, my house, right? <laughs> but, but, but if we go camping in a camper, we don't have to worry about if our sleeping bag is going to be comfortable on the ground, right? Because we got a bed. If we go camping in a camper, we don't have to worry so much about if we're going to get the fire to start, right? Because we got an oven. If we go camping in the camper, we don't have to worry about stumbling out of the tent in the middle of the night and going potty behind the tree covered in poison oak or having to hike a mile and a half to the bathhouse. Why? Because we got a potty right there in the camper, right? 
But here's the deal about camping. If we don't step out of the camper, does it matter if we drive 100 miles into the woods and park in the deep woods or if we're in the Walmart parking lot? If we're not going to step out and be relationally connected, as we strive to work through this four-chair model that we talk about, where we want to meet people who are lost and help them become believers, we want to meet people who are believers, help them become workers, we want to meet people who are workers, help them become disciple-makers. If we're not working through that, we're not going to do that in the camper. We can do it with our family if they're in the camper, but once we're all in there, we're not supposed to stay in there. How are we going to get out? How are we going to join God as he transforms our lives? Because it becomes the same for us as it did for Saul. The adventure of this life begins once we leave those comfortable patterns of our old life behind. We've got a mission here at this church to make disciples who make disciples. Are we getting out of the camper? Are we getting out of our comfort zone? Man, Saul did. I think God wants us to as well. Amen? God bless you guys. Man, I sure do love you. Come back next week and we'll finish Paul's story. Let's pray. Daddy, we are called to be your church. If we're here as followers of the way, if we're here because we've professed faith in your son, our Savior, God, you've got us on mission. Your desire is that we would make disciples and you would get the glory. We can't save anybody. You're the one who saves. But just like you used Paul, you want to use us. Just like you used Ananias, you want to use us. Just like you used Philip last week, you want to use us. God, help us to show evidence of our changed life. Help us to join you where you're at work. Help us to share your gospel. Even with the people we think are are so far gone, What if they're the next Saul? God, we want to join you. We love you. We praise you. We ask all that in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks so much for listening. If you would like to give to our ministry, please check out our website at lewistonocc.org. And don't forget to like, follow, and subscribe to this podcast, as well as our YouTube channel. You can also follow us on Facebook and Instagram so you're always up to date with what's going on here at Orchards Community Church. Take care and God bless.